Welcome back to Rockstock Channel. It is uh, Sunday, February 18th, um, Monday morning, uh, Perth time. We have as a guest, uh, Ron Mitchell from Global Lithium. Uh, not so much about Global Lithium, but uh, just as a veteran of the industry, uh, having been through multiple cycles in uh, a prior job at, at Tangxi and very connected to what's happening in China, we thought uh, this is a rock stock recap, you know, not so much a, uh, you know, a video uh, or, 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 or a vodcast, uh, not that you guys care so much about that distinction. Uh, I just want to highlight, we uh, published, I think, um, I forget exactly the number 91, I think issue number 91 of the Lithium Ion Bull. Lithium Ion Bull has been a newsletter I've published. It's kind of got how I got my start before the podcast and the video uh, in 2017 was, I think, issue number one. We're now seven years into that. Uh, I labeled this one, One Love uh, for Bob Marley and uh, Enter the Dragon for uh, Bruce Lee. Both uh, Bob Marley and Bruce Lee uh, died prematurely, um, but uh, I did not make that reference in the lithium bowl about the lithium market dying prematurely, uh, but probably should reference like Mark Twain, you know, rumors of uh, the demise of lithium, uh, you know, are, are premature. But I do have behind me, as I've uh, flagged before, Three Little Birds uh, song here, Don't Worry, because every little thing is going to be all right. That's also the ringtone on my phone. Um, but for all you listeners, if you don't already get email directly into your email box, the lithium ion bowl, uh, I'd encourage you to visit our website at rkequity.com and register your email there. Uh, and also if you like these videos, please like, and subscribe, uh, and visit Rodney and me on X at lithium ion bowl, uh, and at Rodney Hooper 13, you know, and on patreon.com slash rockstock channel, uh, in the lithium bowl, we talk a bit about, um, leading indicator CATL. Uh, we just had the Albemarle results come out and uh, Albemarle has been like not a great predictor of uh, the lithium and navigator of the lithium market. We're calling this uh, rock stock recap, a, a lithium squeeze box, uh, because it does seem that there's a short squeeze underway. We called a video last year, a lithium squeeze box when Albemarle bid for Liontown in April, uh, there was a recovery in the stocks then. But uh, to look back and think six months later, they were exiting and what's happened in the market, just like how could Albemarle misread this market, you know, so much. So we speak to Ron as we've spoken, you know, uh, to, we've had five meetings, you know, like this Zoom calls per day, you know, for the last kind of four or five weeks. And um, one analyst that I spoke to in Perth was basically, and I agree with him, Listening as we do to all the lithium incumbents uh, is one thing, but uh, we think it's actually more important to listen to CATL, you know, and LG Chem and LG Energy Solutions and Panasonic and their conference calls because they're the purchasers of lithium and they have a bit more uh, knowledge about what's going on. CATL, I didn't realize until uh, I wrote this lithium bull, uh, just market timing wise, just for, for all, um, I'm just kicking myself, you know, CATL sold their Pilbara stock at $4 and 10 cents in March of 2023 shares, which they bought 4.9% that they bought, you know, uh, a few years ago at 30 cents. So that was a leading indicator. Like we should have all just sold our lithium shares when CATL was sharing. So, but CATL stock as many lithium stocks have as a lot of Chinese stocks have not done well. China market broadly, I think are like at five-year lows. It was on the cover of The Economist, you know, how badly the Chinese stock market has, has uh, been going. And that could be viewed as a contrarian indicator. There is that kind of magazine contrarian indicator. If it's on the front page, then, you know, it, it's there for a turn. But uh, look, the stocks are going up. Uh, we have suggested, uh, you know, we're approaching the point of peak pessimism. We don't know, but a lot of people were thinking that after the um, Chinese New Year holiday, uh, everyone would be coming back and you know buying lithium and other activity. So there was a Bloomberg article talking about that travel in China, you know, was was very very strong, and uh, that there uh, there was a feeling that the, the Chinese economy was going to do you know quite a bit better, and maybe the stock market and maybe the lithium purchasing. So we shall see. Enter the dragon. Here we are, and. Uh, um, lipidolite is, it was all over Twitter, you know, in the last, you know, kind of couple of days, especially CATL's, 
I don't know how to pronounce it, Zhang Zhuo, Zhang Zhuo mine was seemingly on care and maintenance or, you know, slowed down. SMM said so in November, but there were further rumors now that it's been like shut down, but UBS, Joras Hartley's and a whole bunch of other people, I don't know who originated this uh, rumor, but it, it, it's, it's gone all over the place. And as we speak, the market is rallying a little bit, not hugely, some stocks more than others, but we definitely want to talk about Lapidolite. There's also some news um, in Australia this week about uh, prospective support for the lithium industry and the nickel industry. Ron can speak about that. In Canada, there was talked about reducing permitting times. Uh, so good progress there, potentially, you know, for the Canadian story. Uh, there were very good, you know, China sales, exports, you know, all good. Um, we had Albemarle's results, uh, which we could talk about a little bit. They had, they ratcheted down their 2030, you know, um, estimates for demand from 3.7 to 3.3 million. The first time they've, they've done that in four years, but nevertheless, uh, for 2024, 2025, very strong. And we think they're severely underestimating grid storage in their 2030 numbers. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Stellantis Mercedes announced big news um, in Europe, GM LG Energy Solutions, a uh, big cathode deal, $19 billion. Uh, GM and Panasonic are investing in you know, a lot of positives, some negatives. The USA is talking about delaying, um, you know, political pressure from the UAW and the Biden administration. So there's rumors there that uh, they're going to go slow. Uh, there's further rumors that they're not only going to put high tariffs that, you know, on Chinese imports, you know, from Mexico and elsewhere, but on national security grounds, they may not allow Chinese cars into America um, because, um, you know, battery or whatever, China will, will, will be watching, you know, American drivers. So the USA is negative. Um, lithium has historically been very much a China dominated theme. We've talked about it. It is very much, you know, a China dominated you know, theme again, even if the U S you know, does go slow, um, we just got to focus on what's going on in China. Before we start today's video, we'd like to thank lithium royalty corp listed on the Toronto stock exchange ticker symbol L I R C. We'll share more later in the video. So with that very long lead in, uh, Ron, you were most recently at the, uh, RIU conference in. Australia. So I don't know very much about mm. that conference, but we saw a lot on Twitter, a lot of companies sharing video and, uh, you know, just written, you know, PowerPoint presentations. If you could just, uh, give us, you know, a sense of what happened there. And also we spoke to you last week or two weeks ago about a whole host of things, you know, African spot, China, Lapidolite, you were recently in China visiting with some of your customers and future customers. So it'd be really good to uh, hear what you're hearing. Um, about where we are and uh, where we're going in the, in the near and medium term. Mm, yeah, yeah, sure. Alan. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. The RAU conference, the Explorers conference held by vertical events is probably one of the preeminent, um, conferences here in Australia. It was really significant attendance. I think there's more than 2000 delegates, um, and a number of, you know, explorer and developer, um, stage projects, um, presenting with, with exhibition booths. So, um. The real theme of the conference, a lot of lithium players, obviously ASX listed lithium players. And I think the general mood of the, the event was, was quite positive uh, in spite of, you know, quite a significant sell off on the equities and, um, obviously the lithium price uh, coming off quite significantly, but I, I think the reality is now, and again, um, these conversations were echoed in informal presentations by a number of, you know, our peer group. And the general view was that we're, we're at or through the floor as far as fudge mount pricing is concerned. Now, look, I've been through this cycle. This is the third cycle I've been through in terms of lithium pricing. And I think what we've seen, what makes this one really interesting is we've seen an all time high of, you know, in terms of fudge mount pricing over 8,000 US a ton. And we've seen the price sort of crash through 1,000 US ton all, all within sort of 24 months. So I think that's got a lot of first time investors a little bit spooked. But what's different this time around clearly is that the buying hasn't stopped. Um, that's what did happen in 2018, 19, um, quite simply the, the, the buying, um, just stopped. There were contracts that, um, that, that they weren't executed. So importantly now, um, the buying's continuing. It's just a question of price. 
So it is different from that perspective, but also how if you think about pricing cycles, typically where prices do come off the market will track sideways for a period of time. And that's exactly what we're experiencing. It's very similar to, to the previous cycles. What I can say in terms of my, my personal experience and with the lifting price cycles is we've been in a, in a, a bear market now for well over 12 months. If you think the pricing has been ratcheting down since really Q4 of 2022. Um, and it just so happened that so, sort of through the early part of this year, the price um, has moved down below a thousand US a ton. So my expectation is that, um, as you rightfully said, when those purchasing managers and try to return to their offices, um, yeah, and my, my view is that inventory positions are low and I'm, it's not just through a single source, it's through multiple sources within the value chain. The, the tip of, typical procurement strategy is to maintain you know, two to three months of inventory through the value chain. What we've seen over the last sort of six, six to 12 months is that that strategy has been adjusted and it's really been hand to mouth. Um, so what that means is when the market does turn from a pricing perspective, consider we're at or below the floor, um, is that, you know, we can expect a level of buying. Now, the question is how long will the market track sideways? That's really the only question we need to, to, to consider here. Is it three months? Is it six months? Is it nine months? Um, my view, it'll be sooner than later. Um, I think we've seen a lot, a, a number of announcements and certainly the REU conference, a number of announcements around, uh, um, supply side, dis, uh, supply side discipline. And I think the incumbents in the next round of quarterly reporting will, will indicate that as well. So Talison's another company that, um, has announced a, 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 a curtailment certainly in terms of production. So we're seeing less units going into the market. Um, you're right. You, you commented on, on COTL earlier, um, whether that's, has been substantiated and all, I can't say, but, but certainly, um, the rumor mill is swirling with regards to a significant curtailment in, in, in terms of lapidolite production in China and also the downstream tolling of that material. So that all bodes well in terms of, um, the general view by the market is that, that we are at or below the floor. And what we've seen in previous price cycles, the, the price will typically overshoot on the upside. It's exactly what we saw in Q4 of 2022. The rest of the market was probably buying lithium, most of the lithium, somewhere between five and 6,000 US a ton, but the spot price went up past eight. Uh, and typically what we're seeing at the moment is that, you know, you've got a single index reporting a spot demand price below a thousand, but most of the deals are not being done at, at that particular spot price. It's typically a basket of prices that makes up the the contract price for the incumbents. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but bear in mind, you know, as, as, as with all, um, major, um, transformations in, in the energy um, industry, this is exactly what we're experiencing. The market will, will not develop overnight. It, it takes, it takes a number of, a number of years and, and ultimately a number of decades. And that's the, you know, the energy transition future that we're, we're, we're currently experiencing. So. I'm not at all surprised that we've seen this correction. In many ways, I think it's actually a good thing. Um, we'll look back in a few years and it's probably the shakeout the industry needed to happen. Call it the lithium recession. The, the industry needed to happen to shake out some of the projects that really were just sucking in capital, um, had no intention of, of being developed. And that was a, a frustration. Um, but what we'll see now with, with this price correction is that the projects that are legitimate that have legitimate experienced management teams and are located in good jurisdictions. Um, they're the projects that will get the investor focus going forward. Ron, what we've been struggling with here is reading bank and broker reports where they have an expectation of increased supply from the Pidolite and some of the lower grade stuff and, and what have you coming out of Africa mm -hmm. and fundamentally I'm struggling to get my head around how it is that a 0.25, 0.3% grade operation can stay afloat and, you know, 1% plus bodgement can't. It just, especially when you look at waste disposal and all those other things, mm. now we're hearing the talk. To be honest, from my perspective, I don't believe that $13,000 a ton is still high enough for that particular mine to keep operating. Your thoughts, how is it conceivable? that Lepidlite could potentially double its production, even if it was planned and ramped, we know that on the Spodgerman side, people are going to delay, I think. So how is it possible given um, the costs and 
you know, costs in China have also gone up. If you look at wage costs and so on, mm. um, how those how those operations could potentially stay in business and grow around current levels. Yeah, it's a good point you raise, and I, I think the experience globally in the lithium sector, whether that's operational development, exploration, and then on the analysis side from the investment banks, I think it's limited. Rodney, I, I know you've uh, you've been commenting on the sector very intelligently over a number of years, and I think there's just a, a lack of appreciation of, of, firstly, how hard it is to get quality projects up and going. Um, and then secondly, you're right, it comes down to pure economics at the end of the day. You've got a resource grading at 0.2 to 0.3, if you're lucky, 0.4% for the better projects in terms of the petalite. How these projects can be competitive with um, spodumene, which we all know um, results in, in high recoveries from a flow sheet perspective. So it, it, it simply doesn't stack up. And I think the expectation that, you know, there's going to be these hundreds of thousands of tons on an LC basis delivered to market from that particular, um, source of lithium mineralization is, is, is hopeful, um, at best. So I think time will tell clearly, I think is, is better education in the market now, certainly more sophistication, uh, in terms of the, the quality of the questions that have been asked through the value chain. Um, and, and I think, you know, if, if, if what's being reported is actually true, um, in terms of, you know, the China lapetalite story, it'll, it'll be a really interesting one to watch, but, but again, it, get, it gets back to those projects that have the best cost profile. Um, and it's, and you also need to consider the, how to deal with the residue that, that, that is a fundamental question, which still hasn't been answered in my view. Um, they're the projects that, that are going to lead the way in terms of new supply to market going forward. Absolutely. And then, um, when we, when we look at it, uh, where we do agree with the analysis, uh, across the industry is that demand is in a fairly tight band, you know, there could be, you know, a couple of surprises, but invariably, if you accept that there's going to be some kind of an easing of interest rates this year. Uh, there are some new products coming online. Um, China will push for exports, in my opinion, this year really mm. hard. I think that number could possibly double from a million to two this year. Um, sorry, EVs out of China. Um, yep. But naturally domestic. And, and then, you know, grid storage, if battery cell prices drop off, that, that could if if fifty dollars a kilowatt hour is really a number that that will incentivize, I think, yeah. a lot of backup storage. But in general, demand seems we everyone seems to have a reasonable handle on that. We think it's supply that adjustment that drives the price better through the year. So, um, in your mind, are there any sort of considerations like you know con contracts in place and so on that? that make existing operations important to keep going, even if they are touch and go, because there's contractual obligations, there can be backward integration, there can be yeah. lots of things. We're in the bizarre position that it is, you know, Talis and Greenbush is that's the highest grade and one of the lowest costs that's, that's easing yeah. back, but that, that, yeah. that makes sense. Your thoughts on, on, on possible other supply adjustments. We've discussed the put a lot other ones? Yeah, good question. Um, and, and you're right. I do certainly agree with you. It's, it's probably the sentiment on the supply side that's really driving the equities and the commodity price at the moment. I, I think, um, you're right. When you get a price downturn, and we've seen this in previous cycles, the incumbent producers and also the developers, um, are going to be obviously watching the market incredibly closely and they're not. They're not going to be willing to turn the tap back on in terms of either growth projects um, or, or, or spending significant amounts of capital to progress a project from a development perspective until such time as they see sustained improvement in pricing. It's as simple as that. You know, it's not a case where, okay, the price goes up, you know, 10%, 15% over, uh, over the next month or two. The market is going to be requiring a sustained improvement in price to demonstrate that yes, we're, we're, we're back in a bear, uh, sorry, a bull market. Um, now whether that's four months, five months, six months is going to depend on each entity, but certainly, um, we're in a, a bit of a conservative, more disciplined, uh, 
uh, period at the moment in, t- in terms of how companies are spending cash and looking at projects. And there's definitely going to be pullback in, in terms of development. So what that means is when the price does rebound, it's going to take longer um, in most instances for, to, for projects to restart. Now, what the incumbents uh, do in terms of managing existing contractual positions, certainly those that have got offtakes, um, are going to, you know, for the most part, be looking to fulfill those offtake positions. Um, but what I have experienced in the past where there's market pullback, um, obviously the, the terms of those offtakes are typically revised as well, either the quantum of the material to be delivered or the pricing um, uh uh, the pricing scenario. What you can probably expect is is a combination of those, maybe in a slight adjustment to the quantum um, in terms of quarterly deliveries, but also maybe the pricing because no one's going to be selling below their production cost on a sustained basis. Even, you know, most of the Western companies could tolerate that for a month or two, but certainly are not going to be willing to tolerate that in, in the longer term. And, and, and Ron, what do you think in your mind, uh, where is incentive pricing for this market to see development? Because we think it's quite a bit higher than where we are now. Yeah. Again, I, I think um, a lot of people truly understand what a, what a cash a cash cost versus incentive price actually is. The two very different things. So, uh, if you think about the amount of capital required to develop a new project, and it's not just the project; it's the infrastructure to be able to get that 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 mine to market effectively. And if you think about the location of some of these development propositions globally. You, you know, there is quite a significant amount of infrastructure, pre-development infrastructure that's required to be built to, to be able to, you know, bring bring that material um, through a port, for example, and then into a, a global value chain. Um, so I think incentive pricing, you know, my view is being reasonably conservative, probably is going to sit somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 a tonne, depending on the jurisdiction. That's what yeah, we would say. We would agree with that if you look at, especially where cost inflation is run to, um, that's a reality we face. Mm-hmm. But if you think about it though, Ron, if we, we tie that across the full industry, 1500 to 2000 translated into a downstream chemical price is still very acceptable in the battery supply chain in terms of, of where that leaves you with sell prices and the industry remaining competitive. Mm-hmm. Jumping in here from the editing room to tell you about Lithium Royalty Corp. Lithium Royalty Corp is at the center of a global energy transition and manages a globally diversified portfolio of lithium-focused royalties in electrification and decarbonization. With 32 royalties on 29 higher-grade, lower-cost projects from exploration to production, LIRC covers all the bases with well-managed risk, ESG considerations, and a scalable royalty structure. Lithium Royalty Corp is traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange ticker symbol LIRC. To find out more, visit lithiumroyaltycorp.com. Uh, Alpenwall had a, uh, a sensitivity analysis between 15,000 and 25,000. What, what um, on 25,000, what does that translate into the spodumene price, Rodney? On a break even, or a, but what I'm saying is, you know, you can have 2,000 for spodumene you know, on a CIF basis and then add the costs onto that and you're still coming up at below 25 okay. without a margin. You know, in, in my opinion, Great. anything su- anything sub $30,000 a ton leaves the, the EV industry competitive. Ron, would you would you agree with that number? I, I would agree, 100%. There needs to be margins through the entire value chain. I think obviously clearly when pricing is at, you know, 80,000 US a ton, uh, that just is completely distortional. And that's what we saw. It wasn't, um, you know, it, it clearly encouraged every project to come into the game. And this is what we saw a response by way of supply last year, but prices are managed somewhere between 1500 and 2000. Yeah. Enough projects get up for the market to be sustainable, uh, and profitable, but it's not, um, you, you know, the, the the pricing in that sort of range is not going to encourage too many projects and hence we get a, a big oversupply and a price correction. So I think the market is still evolving. That's what you are. I guess your mission is there to understand and the lithium market is still very much evolving, becoming more sophisticated. Um, and I think this, as I said, this lithium recession, call it what you will, um, ultimately is exactly what the market needed.
Yeah, we uh, certainly, can, can, uh, Howard and I, in, on the on the school board, we've catapulted to hundreds of projects now, and, and you mentioned it earlier. Everyone mm. drawing money out the system. Um, mm. You know, we we've, we've seen and spoken to people who gave off on on other on other metal metals projects because they just weren't raising money where lithium was attracting and that kind of saw a lot of companies uh, sort of pivot, I guess. You saw exploration what? dollars. There hasn't been a lot of dollars that have gone to projects that shouldn't have gotten funded though. I'm not sure I fully agree with you, Ryan. Like I don't, I didn't need this recession. <laughs> Um, mm. <laughs> and uh, most investors didn't need it. Like the, the price could have gone down to 1200 right, or 1500 yeah. and it's not caused this now because Albemarle's sl slowing down spend. We'll see what Arcadium is going to announce later this mm. week. You know, um, others are, are slowing down and that's just going to set up the cycle for, for another overshoot, you know, on the upside. So exactly. you're right. The, the market is evolving. It's still very immature. Like I've actually looked at iron ore, you know, and oil and, you know, those prices are volatile also, but mm. iron ore going from like 50 to 200, right? That, that was extreme. That's a four time increase. But most of the time it's going between, you know, 80 and 150, right? So th that, that fan or oil goes from 60 to 120, but it's not so crazy. But for lithium to go from 4,000 to 80,000, you know, back down to 13,000, that is representative of a very immature market, still a very small market where I remember Rodney and our, some of our first, um, podcast you were talking about like just a swing of 10 or 15,000 tons either way you know can vastly increase you know the price or decrease the price you know of lithium and we're seeing that here we put I put in the lithium bowl um uh I want to thank you know Evan Cranston who uh you know flagged this on, on, on Twitter he just showed the JP Morgan report and he just took it like so they build a very sophisticated supply model but in that supply model they had sigma lithium Right, Sigma Lithium, who had announced stage two and stage three, JP Morgan was basically saying there's going to be a 37,000 ton surplus this year. But in their model was that stage two and stage three were going to be producing this year. And Sigma just announced last week that they have an MOU for funding just for stage two, not for stage two and three. Right. So the likelihood that that supply, stage three is not coming on stream. Stage two is unlikely if they had, or don't even have the loan for that. And then we had Dwayne Sparks, you know, who's writing very popular tweets about lapidolite. Today he tweeted about the difference between five and a half percent spodumene and six percent spodumene. So a lot of, you know, JP Morgan and others have in their forecast, you know, the PFS or the DFS from Sigma, which says 250,000 tons of SC6, you know, is going to translate into. I don't know, 36,000 tons, you know, for stage one, right? But if they're producing at five and a half percent, right? That material is much worse in the converter. So the, 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 the converters recoveries are much lower. So they're actually mm -hmm. going to translate into less than 36,000 tons. They didn't say mm -hmm. like, couldn't yep. estimate how much, but it's going to be less, but the models say it's going to be what it says in the feasibility study. So there's a lot of scope for supply not to be as large as predicted. Um, and I just thought that that was useful. One of the things you mentioned in our call a couple of weeks ago is just also just the, the quality of African supply, right? There was a lot, you know, the work that was done and just so like, we understand in Zimbabwe, there's Bikita, there's Sabi Star. These are legitimate mines that have been in operation. They've done a lot of work, but a lot of the other material coming out of Zimbabwe and other places doesn't seem to have gone through a three, four, five year, you know, uh, progression that a typical Western Australian mine would go through. And that has resulted in what? In the marketplace, Ron? Oh, it's, it's a, you'd have to argue, um, general, general pullback. Um, pricing is the key driver to, you know, 
expenditure throughout the value chain, whether it's exploration, development, metallurgy, feasibility studies, these things all cost millions of dollars. So commodity prices driving decisions, not only by the incumbents, but the next wave of explorers, explorers and developers as well. You're right. That elastic band is going to be potentially stretched because of the pullback we're seeing, given where the commodity price is at. And also largely un unrealistic expectations around incentive pricing by, you know, some of the analysts out there. But what about the quality of some of the uh, material that's coming out of Africa? Yeah, that's, that's something, and it, it gets back to spend as well, uh, where you're putting your dollars, because the quality, what we're, at least what we're seeing is, is largely, if you look at the metallurgical test where that was done on some of those assets, it was um, very much a smash and grab operation. In response again to that, that all time high lithium price, uh, where every project makes sense, right? 8,000 US a ton. So what you had was um, people going in, um, in an undisciplined way, um, looking to develop projects in Africa because I couldn't get the material out of Australia, but also there was very little technical due diligence done on those projects by way of metallurgical test programs, understanding the ore body and the characteristics of the mineralogy. So what we're seeing now is. Um, you don't know what you have until you drill and blast it. Is it spodumene? Is it lapidolite? Is it pedalite? Is it some other lithium mineral? Or perhaps no, no lithium mineralization. Um, you know, to do a full suite metallurgical test program, which underpins your flow sheet, you, know, you, you need to spend at least 12 to 18 months. And you need to drill throughout the entire ore body to be able to generate that, that understanding because ultimately, as you said, it flows through to recoveries. Um, your metal metallurgical test program will underpin your flow sheet and ultimately your cost base. So if you don't do the work, you don't get the results. Simple. And also from our earlier calls, you, you mentioned you had recently visited, uh, China and some new converters and, um, what, what was your feedback from, from those visits? The technology is um, impressive, you know, world-class from, from what I saw, but, but again, I talked about the, the procurement model. China being adjusted, um, and that's not just in lithium, that's in a whole range of, of industries. This, you know, typically managing a two to three month inventory position of spot domain, chemicals, cathode, battery cells, um, what you've seen is a complete pullback in that to, to managing very, very smaller positions because working capital is just as important as in China as it is here in Australia, ultimately. So. Uh, managing a significant inventory position. If you think the market is flat, um, it, it, it's unlikely to be profitable. So, but again, on the sentiment side of things, when that market turns and, you know, the buyers think they can get a price or, or, or may face a higher price next week or next month, that's when you see the buying tend to, to, to ramp up and elevate and that transfers to higher, high pricing ultimately for, for raw materials. But if you can, uh, you know, just comment on, you know, to the extent that you can, your perception of what's going on, you know, M&A, mm. you know, in WA and yeah. how it will unfold. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I obviously can't comment on existing shareholders, but look, w what I can say more broadly is that each company ha will have its own strategies. It relates to contracting, floor prices, pricing more broadly, contract terms, and then corresponding selling prices. Um, you know, you're talking about a couple of entities there, as you rightfully said, are well-capitalized, well-entrenched, have existing production assets, existing uh, cash flows. The strategy there around, you know, commercial contracting, very different to, you know, a new producer or a new developer from a, uh, that's trying to develop a Greenfields project. Um, so you will see quite significant um, variations, deviations in terms of each each company's risk appetite in terms of taking on price floors and ceilings. Um, but you're right. Some companies will look at it. Others won't. Uh, it makes sense for some companies, perhaps not, doesn't make sense for others. So, um, but look, yeah, no, last year was a, a pretty active, um, a very active year in terms of, you know, M&A and equity positions more broadly within the West Australian uh, industry. I think there's probably a realization that it's a great jurisdiction to be develop, developing lithium projects, given the expertise that's here. I can talk about, you know, the, the ecosystem of experience that we have here in Western Australia, and I'm sure Canada is looking to, to develop something similar, but also realization that, you know, spodumene, developing spodumene projects, hard rock spodumene projects in, in the state of Western Australia is generally, it happens 
a lot faster than other parts of the world. Um, you know, we've got the runs on the board. So clearly if you look at the M and A cycle and how that plays out, then, then obviously putting investments into projects or, or industries, um, that have the high chance of success makes, makes perfect investment sense. So I'm, I'm not surprised by that. Um, to answer the second part of your question, how does it play out going forward? Time will tell. Um, we've seen price equity values of most of the, the really good projects come off quite significantly. Most companies are probably 52 week lows in terms of share price. Um, so it's a great, great opportunity to be buying in my perfect sense. If you believe in the thematic and let's face it, yeah. I was just going to say the, the consumers ultimately will decide, right? You, know, you can put out whatever product you want in the market, but it's the next wave of consumers that will decide where they put their money and how they, how they buy products. And in my personal view, it's going to be my kids making the decision. It's not you and I, they're going to influence the market going forward in terms of our, our, our purchasing activities. It's going to be the next wave of consumers and they're far more environmentally uh, conscious than we were. And they're far more technologically advanced than we were. So an EV ticks both of those boxes. Yeah. I want to agree with you on that, Ron. But I, again, I spoke to another analyst in Western Australia, who's, you know, my age, Rodney's age in mid fifties. And he's, you know, all the talk a few years ago of like the, 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 the Gen Z, you know, calling up on his phone, you know, before he makes an EV purchase and says, where was this lithium bought? That's, that's a, that's a pipe dream. Uh, long-term future and all of the worries of the of, of the auto oems they're going to care you know uh, about you know the sustainability and esg and you, you know um they're buying uh, you know dirty indonesian you know nickel you know at the moment um and they're very and they need low prices right it's, it's hard enough mm. for them to you know make money from their high price cars so they're not rushing to pay you know green premiums or, or, or yep. you know, so I'd, I'd like to, to believe that, but fundamentally your project and others in Western Australia, Western Australia is a very socially acceptable jurisdiction that there's a thought like Ken Brinsden's moving to <laughs> Quebec. He has an attitude of kind of go big or go home, right? Like the, the Rio Tintos and the BHP is like something that could be like a mega mine that could support a hundred thousand tons, you know, of hydroxide, you know, capacity. Hmm. The last cycle, and we had a bit of a false, the M&A distorted things last year. First, Albemarle and Liontown, and then all that M&A activity in uh, WA in, in, the, in the final quarter of the year, you know, masked the lithium price, you know, falling, and it just gave us, you know, this impression strategics are, are taking this long-term view, then, you know, it must be um, supportive of lithium equities. And, and, you know, clearly, once the M&A stopped, and Albemarle is not going to make any M&A this year. You listen to what they, um, their conference call last week, but a Rio could very well come in, right? And, you know, now would be a great time, you know, for a Rio or BHP to come in. But when, when you think of a Rio and you think of some of these players, they do think very big. So what does this mean? Like lithium has a lot of small, you know, modest sized projects that are going to be second quartile, you know, it would be great, you know, find 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1.5% large, you know, hundred million tons with that characteristic, but mm. the projects you're developing are smaller, you know, and slightly lower grade, you know, but nevertheless, you know, infrastructure matters, jurisdiction matters. Um, how do we think about, you know, yeah. any possibility from, from big guys or just what do you, and you just, sorry to, to, to keep going, like the prices are at 52 week lows. They are depressed. It's one thing. I think there mm. is a short squeeze that is underway and that will continue. We are going to get a rise in the lithium price, but you know, is it just going to rise to a thousand or twelve fifty and then level off, or is it going to go yep. to two thousand? Like, at what level do, do, does like sentiment return and speculation comes into the market returns, and then the market cap of your company, you know, reaches a level where the prospect of you know raising the equity and debt capital you need is is, is doable without massive dilution. Mm, yeah, that is a very tricky question to answer, and I don't have a crystal ball, so I'm I I won't try and find the the, the exact sweet spot. I don't think I have the answer there. There's a lot a lot needs to play out. But look, first party question more on scale. I mean, you got to look at it in the context of most of, a lot of the exploration um, 
activity and the discoveries that have been made have really been in light of a very high lifting price that has encouraged, you know, many projects to go and spend a drill bit to try and find lithium. Um, so with my, most lithium discoveries, it does take you a while to build up your resource, you know, to, to move from a, a 10 million ton, 20 million ton resource to a 50 plus million ton resource. It doesn't typically happen overnight. It does take a bit of time. Um, and also, you know, you need to also understand the, the complexities of building or developing approvals in, in some of these larger resources, the larger your project, the bigger the footprint the more complex your approvals timelines can be. So there's, there's that challenge as well. But my view is, I think you're going to see greater consolidation clearly for, for a, a number of the smaller projects is probably going to be a consolidation play at some point. I'm not quite sure what, what, where the pricing needs to be to really stimulate that activity. Um, but as I said, what you're going to see for the first, at least half of this year is a number of projects going to the holding pattern. We're pushing on, we're finding that, that perfect balance between discipline and protecting our balance sheet and also pushing on the project because it's important that as a company, if you believe in the thematic, that you're ready to go when the market does rebound. Um, as to what price the market rebounds to this year, that's crystal ball stuff, Howard. I, I think you'd agree. If I had the answer to that, um, I probably wouldn't be doing my day job. Um, but clearly, clearly it's at the floor, um, probably punched through the bottom end on the floor price in my personal view. Um, and I think it's only upwards from here, but as to the order of magnitude of the market going up, um, time will tell. Okay. Ron, thank you very much for uh, joining Rockstock again. Uh, hope to have you on uh, later in the year to talk specifically about Global Lithium, but to anyone who wants to know about Global Lithium, I'd recommend you go to the RIU uh, presentation, which I think is on your website or on Twitter, um, and they could hear directly what you said there last week. My it's pleasure. Sayonara. Thank you, Al. Thanks, Rodney. <laughs> Thanks, Always Rod. great.